it's your boy D Neil back with another reaction video, guys. Here we are with the incredible stories of Britain's bravest soldiers, Victoria Cross for Valor Part Three, guys. I've enjoyed these uh, this incredible story of these incredible heroes, uh, the circumstances and the situations that they faced, and for them to push ahead, to not retreat, to not run. But to choose to fight through it, there, there's there's no more. You can't get any braver than that. You can't get any braver than that. Before we jump in, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Ring notification bell. Get a video a thumbs up so it gets suggested. Social media and Patreon all up top. You know, subscribe to any of it. Put all the links in the description. All you got to do is hit the link. Follow me. Talk to me. I'm human. I talk back. Uh, if you guys got a favorite video suggestion, you can subscribe to Patreon or drop it in the comment section. And this is a Patreon request from Chris. What we got? During the Arnhem battle, a glider pilot called Lieutenant Mike Dornsey found himself defending a sector very close to where Robert Kane was. Here's the report. Uh, it says the position was continually attacked by superior forces of enemy tanks and infantry. On three occasions, the enemy overran the sector, necessitating a counterattack. Dornsey led each sortie with such determination that the positions were regained with heavy loss to the enemy. In the face of heavy small arms and mortar fire, he personally attacked machine gun posts with complete disregard for his own safety. The next day, uh, the Germans attacked again with uh, tanks and self-propelled guns. This time, Dornsey lost the sight of one eye. In spite of the pain, though, he refused wow. to be evacuated. And then on the next day, they came back with tanks again. His men withdrew, and he was left alone, facing down a tank. He threw a gammon bomb through its hatch and blew it up. Now, for this, he was recommended for a VC, but they turned him down. That's what? how hard it had become to win one. Oh, my God. He's literally fighting back superior enemy forces, lost sight in an eye, kept fighting. His men retreated. He kept fighting there alone, and he got turned down for the like that. Let you know, like like he said, how prestigious, how high, how much it takes to win that award, to win a Victoria Cross of Valor. Wow. Dante's incredibly brave, though. That's how hard it That's had become crazy. to win one. Jeez. Since the end of the Second World War to the present day, only 11 VCs have been won. And this creates a problem. The fewer VC winners there are, the greater the burden of living in its spotlight. Mm. I'd sooner have back with me the pals my buddies, my comrades back with me rather than any medal. Mm. In 1951, okay. Private William Speakman was part of a battalion of the Black Watch Regiment defending a hilltop in Korea. The hill was attacked by 6,000 Chinese soldiers and with the Black Watch troops outnumbered by 12 to 1, the situation looked bleak. But oh. as the hill was about to be overrun, Speakman appeared like a six foot four inch human grenade launcher. And I thought, well, all this stuff has been done. We've primed them. I, I might as well use the bloody things, you know. So uh, that's it. And we went up there and we, we just did it. Ten times he went back so for more grenades. And then when they ran out, he lobbed beer bottles and ration tins at the Chinese, anything he could get his hands on. Eventually, the attack was broken, and Speakman was wow. a hero, but he found it hard to cope with the attention the VC brought. He told one reporter that the medal made him feel like a freak in a freak show. Sometimes it gets a little bit too much. Not sometimes, a lot of the time it gets too much. You, um, people try, try to do something for you. They try to say thank you in their own little way. They say, well, tell me what happened. You, ju you just... You either don't want to, or you just sometimes you just say, well, no, it's, uh, I've forgotten all about it now. And that's the truth. It's a bit overwhelming for an ordinary person. The difficulty with the Victoria I Cross. I can't imagine that. Just kind of, I, I guess, like, like, people always want to hear the stories. You, you, 
to cause to win a Victoria across the valley, you see how hard it is. Not many people are winning these. Not very few. Very, very few. So it's kind of like once you do win one, it's, it's almost like you are stepping into the spotlight. Like because it, it, it's such a rare, such a rare thing to get. And so I can imagine so many people wanting to come up to him, wanting to hear his story, wanting to thank him in their own way, wanting to do all the end. He's he probably like I just I don't want to be in the spotlight. Like I don't I I throw this medal away if you could bring all the guys, all the people I serve with back. Like I throw this medal away in a minute. Uh, he he doesn't want all that. He just did what he thought was right in that moment, and he fought for his for his fellow men. And that's just what he did. It's a bit overwhelming for an ordinary person. The difficulty with a Victoria Cross or a, an award of that standing being awarded is you, you were just beginning to get over the shock and the mm. horror of what you've been through. And then you're given this award and you have to relive it all over mm. again, probably for the rest of your life, because people will be asking you about it for the rest of your life. They're just incredible people. Um, I'm being soft about them, because they, they were tough men <laughs> that day. <laughs> but uh, I've, I've, you know, when I first started um, being involved with the association, there were 450 alive, and now there are only 15. So there's been a lot of sadness. Um, but I've, we've had some incredible times together. The last two VCs, both posthumous, were won in the Falklands War 21 years ago. And the reason it's been such a long time is quite straightforward. Modern warfare with remote control weapon systems mm. arguably separates you from the enemy in a way that hasn't happened in past wars. It gives you an idea of how rarely you can justify a VC and how uh, infrequently the opportunity, and it doesn't need an opportunity, the opportunity to win a VC comes past your door. The days of soldiers sticking their heads above the parapet and taking out half the enemy with nothing but a fruit knife are gone. The days of soldiers like this man, Gurkha rifleman Lackeyman Gurung. In Burma, on May the 13th, 1945, Gurung was manning the most forward post of his platoon when 200 Japanese soldiers attacked the position. Grenades were thrown into his trench, which rifleman Gurung snatched up and threw back. Wow. Unfortunately, the third grenade exploded in his hand, blowing off his fingers, shattering his right arm and severely wounding him in the face, body and right leg. For the next four hours, wave after wave of fanatical attacks were thrown in by the enemy and all were repulsed. Even though Gurung, alone in his trench, had to load and fire his rifle using only his left hand. Of the 87 enemy dead counted in the vicinity after the battle, 31 lay in front of Gurung's position. Wow. 31. Wow. Literally with one hand, like, picking up the, 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 the fear, like, picking up an actual grenade. Know what I'm saying? Like, it, it was, this grenade was active. Picking it up and throwing it back it would already be scary, but the fact that one blew up in his hand, took out his fingers, took basically took out the usage of that arm, it seems like. So he's only got one arm left. He's got damage to the face. When the when the battle, when all the dust cleared, 31 men lay in front of his position. That's crazy. <laughs> So, is the greatest medal in the world in danger of becoming extinct? Will those seven in the safe at Hancock's jewelers man. ever be engraved? I can see that, like, because of what he said, with, with the modern technology, you can control a lot of things without necessarily putting yourself in the line of fire, it seems like. And the technology is only going to keep continue 
technology is only going to continue to evolve. And so it's like, I understand what he's saying with that. Do it, do it. There, there's not, where it was already very rare to actually be able to win this medal. Now, like, the opportunities are, are even rarer now. So, is the greatest medal in the world in danger of becoming extinct? Will those seven in the safe at Hancock's jewelers ever be engraved? I think it would be quite wrong uh, to say that uh, there will never be an opportunity for a Victoria Cross to be won in future warfare. There will be opportunities. There will always be personal braveries in an intensive operation, a long drawn out operation, that deserves that reward. There would be certainly plenty in this generation who would be candidates for being awarded the Victoria Cross. Courage isn't lost from mankind. It's just, just the circumstances. Back on the banks of the Rhine, Major Robert Kane was into the third day of the siege of Osterbeek and the Germans had changed their tactics. Possibly fed up with losing so many tanks, they decided to batter the British into submission with constant shelling and mortar fire. The Germans by this stage had ringed the British positions with a hundred artillery guns along with 12 of the dreaded Nebelwerfers, multi-barreled mortars which fired six bombs at a time. Somehow this bombardment seemed to inspire Kane, driving him to ever greater feats of bravery. What? While most of the troops kept their heads down and their fingers crossed, hoping a shell wouldn't land on them, he went in search of tanks. Witnesses spoke of a madman running through a hailstorm of fire in these very streets with his trousers torn off, blood pouring from wounds in his legs, firing his piet at tank after tank after tank. And they said he's falling... That's the, crazy. Some were saying he's falling in the pit from the hip, like a bloody cowboy. There was this figure, wounded, bandaged, dirty, dishevelled, but still coming round, still wherever the point of danger was, still encouraging the men all the time. Some were saying he'd knock four, five, six tanks out. Yeah, you can put yourself in the Germans' position and say, whoever's knocking out these tanks must be... Well... So someone out of this world, I say. Yeah, so you get, it would be somewhat crazy. Like they're probably that's the kind of man that scares you. That 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 fights with dis, disregard for his own life, but is gonna keep fighting no matter how bloodied, no matter how bruised, is gonna fight till his very last breath. And in that moment, he feels no fear. There's nothing scarier than that. Well, so someone out of this world, I say. In his diary, he says his feet felt like they had a thousand pins sticking in them and that his socks oh filled with blood. Later in the day, he says he felt something hot and sticky running down the side of his face. Turns out he'd fired so many shells, one of his eardrums had burst. He disregarded his own wounds. He was wounded seriously wounded and bleeding and, and torn to shreds, yet uh, he fought on because that was his duty. He refused to go back for medical treatment until there was a lull in the battle. He fought with a total focus on what he was meant to be doing, and many VC holders have this sense of focus. They, they have a focus that sees that it clearly what they've got to do, and they must do that regardless of the effect it has on his own life. And this selflessness, is perhaps the, mo the key issue in winning a VC. Wow. To understand just how important this business of selflessness is, you need to know the story of John Cruikshank. Cruikshank was the captain of a Catalina flying boat, which was very badly shot up during a suicidal attack on a U-boat. Although he sank the U-boat, one of his crew was killed, three others injured, and Cruikshank himself was hit 72 times, including wounds to both lungs. So there he is, with his lungs hemorrhaging, slipping in and out of consciousness, and barely able to breathe. 
but he was determined to bring the wounded crew home safely. So he kept the plane wow. in the air for an hour until the sea conditions were safe enough for a landing. And that's an amazing story. But it's not as amazing as what the Secretary of State has written here. He says, I think that the VC has been earned in this case, although an element of self-preservation enters into it. And that's the tricky bit. You see, if you're the captain of an aeroplane, you bring it back and therefore save the lives of everyone on board. You also yeah. save your own life. You can't really win. That's insane to think it's that was about self-preservation. I'm sure. I, I don't know the story. I don't know him personally, but I'm sure if there if he didn't have any crew on that plane, if it was just him, he probably would have went down. He he probably he probably would have gave in to to his conscience. But I I feel like the fact that he did have wounded crew and he wanted to make sure that they got back safe. He wanted to make sure that they were able to go home and get back and get the attention that they needed. I think that's the focus, and that's the thing that kept him alive. I think he made it much bigger than just about himself. But uh, So I don't necessarily agree with the, the self-preservation in that after hearing that story. I think if without the without his wounded crew on board, uh, he he probably would have passed out and gave in. In life, you can't really win. Arnhem was a lost cause too. There were so many wounded British soldiers by the fourth day of the siege that the Germans sportingly arranged a ceasefire so they could be evacuated. Wow. Kane could have gone. He was a wreck. He was half blind, he was half deaf, his legs were perforated with machine gun and shrapnel wounds. But he chose to stay, and that meant wow. he was still here on the fifth day of the siege. That's crazy. That's insane. This, in the Germans' eyes, was doomsday, the day when they'd mount their biggest push. They threw everything at the British. Tanks, artillery, flamethrowers, mortars, the lot. The British had arrived in Arnhem with supplies for three days. This was their ninth and the fifth in the hell of Oosterbeek. It was shaping up to be the shortest firefight in history. But Major Kane had other ideas. Oh, this man is ridiculous. Kane found himself down by the church and pretty soon, he was out of ammunition for his Piat, so he switched to a mortar like this. Now, the idea of a mortar is that you jam it into the ground, you drop the shell into the tube, it fires up in the air and lands on the German positions. But the Germans were so close that he was firing it like this, oh like a normal God. gun. Now, imagine what that must have looked like from a German's point of view. This man with his trousers blown off, caked in blood with sticky stuff coming down the side of his face, firing a mortar horizontally at you. Yes. It must have been unnerving. Had it, it, in it had to be. Just, just imagining that, oh my God. It must have been unnerving. Wow. In Kane's VC citation, it says of the events of that day, by a skillful use of this weapon and his daring leadership of the few men still under his command, he completely demoralised the enemy, who, after an engagement wow. lasting more than three hours, withdrew in disorder. Robert Kane had turned the tide in the battle, and this is another vital factor in winning a Victoria Cross. Your actions have to create a ripple effect. They have to help. Save the day. Mm. On the Monday, it was the final day of the battle, and the Germans, that was 9th SS Panzer Division, had been trying for since the Friday to break Major Kane's block because that was the key to cutting us off mm. from the, the whole division off from the river, and we would have been finished. We all knew that. I mean, it was obvious to us all. 
but he made sure that they didn't get through um, to his great credit. His action had tremendous impact on the troops as a whole and probably uh, helped them keep their resolve and help win the battle out of proportion to the size of his own personal command. It was the most wonderful example to everyone. A major firing at tanks is, is something you don't hear of, really. We all wanted to emulate him, of course, um, which we tried to do to our best ability. The, the effect that uh, Major Robert Kane had on the men was obviously his leadership and the fact that they were on the defensive, but he was moving, he was showing himself, he was rallying where there was the greatest danger, and that has the most huge impact upon people who have just got to stay there and endure and be brave. They need something to focus That's upon. Facts. He was that focus. He led by example That's completely. Facts. That's facts. When you see somebody who's half blind, half dead, caked in blood, trousers blown off, and you see him still fighting, he doesn't want to retreat. He doesn't want medical attention. He wants to keep fighting. Shrapnel blown all in him. And he keeps pushing forward. Seeing that, with all the odds stacked against you, seeing something like that would inspire you to keep fighting as well. Would inspire you to keep pushing. Because if he can go through that, then I can surely survive. Had to be what... what, what uh. His, his fellow, his fellow uh, brothers were saying, that's crazy. Be brave. They need something to focus upon. He was that focus. He led by example completely. I mean, I'm sure that whoever got back over that river of the South Staffords could owe that fact to Bob Kane and nobody else because it was his example that rallied them. His bravery was suicidal and utterly selfless. His tank-killing antics rallied the troops, beat off the enemy and helped keep the defences at Osterbeek intact. These were the reasons why this man won a Victoria Cross. And not just any VC either. According to his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Derek McCarty, it was the finest Victoria Cross of the whole war. After the Germans withdrew, the British, out of ammo, food and ideas, and knowing by this stage that the Second Army wasn't coming, silently crossed the river at night to safety. Kane knew they were retreating, but he didn't want to look beaten. When they were in utter defeat by the river, withdrawing over the river, the battle was lost. He found a razor and somehow he shaved so that at least he would go back looking respectable and wow. like an officer above his men. Amazing man. That, that, that is Kane amazing. was awarded that his amazing. Victoria Cross at Buckingham Palace on the 2nd of November, 1944, the first Manxman ever to get one. Wow. But like many other VC winners, he was never very comfortable with all the ballyhoo and fuss. I can imagine that. Kane was the only one of five VC winners at Arnhem who lived to tell the tale. Not that he would tell the tale, of course. VC winners rarely do. And that's a pity, because Kane's tale is one of how many more young men, how many more teenage soldiers might have died had he not fought quite so ferociously. After the war, he left the army and went back to working for Shell in Nigeria and the Far East. He died of cancer in 1974. Wow. Sadly, that meant I never met him, which is a shame for two reasons. Firstly, because I'm absolutely fascinated by VC winners. And secondly, because I'm married to his daughter. She didn't even know he'd won a Victoria what? Cross until after he died. He never thought to mention it. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. You know, 
We have a rather warped sense of what constitutes bravery these days. I mean, even David Beckham is called a hero for scoring a penalty. But when you look at VC winners and hear their stories, well, enough said. Man, uh, Major Robert Kane and everyone else who, who has won a VC, it, it just doesn't get any braver than that. It, it doesn't get any braver for that. And even when they win, it's, they don't want, they, they're not doing it for the attention. They're not doing it for the medal. They're doing it be, because they want to protect the people around them. They want to fight for the people around them. And so they're, they're fighting as hard as they possibly can. And they're continuing to push in the face of fatigue, in the face of overwhelming odds, in the face of body parts blown off, bleeding, uh, half blind, half deaf. And in the face of everything, they continue to fight. Uh, that's just special. All we got for this, you guys got a favorite video suggestion, you can subscribe to Patreon and drop it in the comment section. Subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell, get a video a thumbs up so I get suggested. Social media and Patreon are all up top. If you can subscribe to any of it, pull all the links in the description. All you got to do is hit the link, follow me, talk to me. Love talking to you guys. You guys are the most incredible team on YouTube. It's your boy, d Out.